Good evening and welcome to this special edition of On The Spot. My name is Patrick Kamara. Burundi and South Sudan are two members of the East African community that are now having civil strife. And that is impacting on the region economically and otherwise. But can we get solutions from Arusha at the seat of the East African Community Headquarters? My guest tonight is the Speaker of that Assembly, the Right Honorable Dan Kidaga. <laughs> Honorable Dan Kidega, let me first of all congratulate you because this is the first time you've been on the spot having uh, been elected Speaker of the East African Assembly. Thank you so much, Patrick. Good evening, viewers. And, uh, you know, most important, I must also extend my appreciation to, to Ugandans who have afforded me the opportunity, first of all, to serve at that level. And then, most specifically, my colleagues who found it befitting to bestow upon me the, the chance to offer the stewardship. And, and I'm very grateful, Amel. But how was it like? Because you came to the leadership as a speaker of the East African Assembly after tumultuous past. You know, you take of, over a seat of a, a colleague in, in, in a, an assembly that was so divided. Yeah, very interesting. A brief background that the, our uh, Ugandan citizens need to know is that the East African Legislative Assembly is an assembly of uh, 45 members as of now, because of the five members, each country sends in nine representatives. So I was one of the nine, or Ugandans who are sent to represent Uganda and the region in that parliament. And it so happened that it is the time for Uganda to offer leadership at the assembly as a speaker. When we got there, of course, we elected Honorable Margaret Zewa to be the speaker. So when this speaker was elected, after like one and a half years, she got into a leadership wrangles with the colleagues who elected her and eventually we, we, we had to request her to leave the seat. When she, she was removed from being speaker, Uganda had to continue offering leadership. So my colleagues... You, you are being polite and diplomatic. You yeah. did not just request. You did something more than request her to leave. Uh, there was a regime change. Okay. <laughs> because if you say request, she had an, probably an option to stay. No, she didn't have an option. I was just trying to be kind to the process and uh, being okay. diplomatic. So we removed her from leadership because we found that she was no longer offering the kind of leadership we wanted for the assembly. And, uh, and there, after the, 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 the members had to elect another Ugandan. And by, by God's grace, all the 40-something members from all the partner states decided unanimously that we think uh, Dan Kidega should offer leadership. And I was chosen to, to be the speaker without a vote. So that, that, that's how I came to, 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 so, to conclude. So, so you, you came into the seat after that tumult has passed, a mm -hmm. member who was supposed to lead uh, uh, the way this, the assembly, but problem the assembly. Now, have you gotten the confidence of all the members? Do they support you wholeheartedly? Amazingly. You may want to know that uh, personally, I wasn't. I didn't have the ambition to become the speaker. I was the choice of the members. That's what a political pol a politician says. No, absolutely, it sounds very political, but it is a reality. If you cross-check your facts with the assembly, you find that I was requested by my colleagues to offer leadership, and that's the the, the basis upon which there was nobody contesting against me. There was no vote. I think this is the highest office, political office I'm holding, where I am not even spent a penny. I didn't have to print a, 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 a poster or, or, or buy water or soda for anybody to get this office. So it, it came just like that. It was, uh, uh, I think, God sent that they needed somebody who can put the assembly together. So at the time uh, I came in, the assembly was seriously divided. Our image in the public was very wanting. We had a lot of backlog of work to do. In the entire two and a half years, we had passed just two pieces of legislation, two laws. So what is it about the Honorable Kidega, with all respect, who probably is among the youngest, if not the youngest in the assembly, That's right. and everybody decided to say, he's going to be our leader. Is it that maybe you, you're malleable, they can move you the way they want? Oh, not at all. I'm not malleable at all. I'm very firm. I am, I'm, 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 I'm personally, 
it, it will sound like I'm self-exalting, but the, the reality of the fact is I've learned a few things in life. I may look young, but I've been in the corridor of leadership for some time. You may want to know that this is almost my 15th year as a legislator doing parliamentary work. So why did you have ambition in the first place? I didn't have ambition for this because I was supporting another candidate, and I'm so principled in my political practice. When I offer you my words, I don't backtrack on that. I was supporting Honorable Dora to be the speaker of the East African Legislative Assembly. Even at the, at the point of being taken as the speaker, I was still supporting Honorable Dora to replace the Honorable Ziwa. So I was picked on the basis of the strength of my character, the way I work with my colleagues. I am a, I'm, I'm a consensus builder in my leadership style. And I, I, I always stand firm on facts and truth. And all these years together with my colleagues, you, you, your value system stands out. You, your character, what you stand for, your kind of nature of leadership comes out and the judgment becomes so easy. So those people have been observing me for a while. So they saw the qualities of leadership in me. One of the former presidents in our country, Godfrey Benaisa, he was president for a few days, uh, yeah. <laughs> for a few months, and he said, if you can only be head of state for, for, for seven days, you'll have finished. Your position is almost up there. Describe to us the feeling of the seat as a speaker for the East African. Yeah, <laughs> very importantly. You see, the most important thing, I always find a lot of people make a lot of mistakes. You see, when you are in a public office, that is the people's office. If you try to uh, uh, exude so much powers upon the people you're serving, you most time find yourself into trouble. So myself, I decided to remain myself. That's the first thing I decided to do. Remain the Dan Kidega that everybody knows. Same kind of friends I used to have, same kind of everything, but maintain the decorum of the office and know the purpose for which that organization has been put in place and you offer stewardship. I believe in the servant leadership concept. I believe that when you take such offices of high caliber, you are in service, and therefore you must put the interest of the people you are leading as a priority, and yourself list. If you try to service or irrigate your personal interest and too much assertion in terms of authority without being consultative, you get problem. And on the basis of that, this office is smooth, light and easy to drive. Easy to drive, but the region is not easy. In Absolutely. Burundi, we have civil strife. In South Sudan, it, instability. And, and it, that is impacting on the economic performance of the region. Are there any solutions that can come from Arusha? Yeah, thank you. So I think I need to, to first drop this uh, 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 from uh, the basics. You know, one of the reasons why the founding fathers of the African Union or oh, oh, the Kwame Nkrumah, the Hale Selassie, the Nyerere Malimu Nyerere, the, uh, the, 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 the founding father of the African unity, thought of putting African together is to solve the problem of the African people. Many people have been shouting or complaining that Burundi is on fire. Now we are admitting South Sudan. Are we performing a community of conflict or what exactly are we doing? I want to make this categorically clear, Patrick to our viewers that the purpose for which we are integrating as a region is to solve the problem of the African people, the problem of the East African people. And one of the problems of the East African people is the governance issues, the issues of the conflict which is raging now. The purpose for which the community is in place is to make sure we solve our problem in leadership and economic issues. Now, Burundi, when they went through the elections, problem came up. All, the whole world <coughs> shied away from attending to the problem. When the President Kuruziza decided to run for elections, people looped sanctions, all kind of statements, did not even go to observe the elections. But we as East Africans had a duty to be there. So we went to, to, to Burundi and observed the elections. That an election that everybody else in the international community thought was an illegality. Absolutely. So why did you go? We went for fundamental reasons. When you have your child in your home, in your backyard, who is not exactly as smart as others, you don't neglect that child. So Burundi is, the, is not a smarter kid in the East African community? As of now, that's what the East African community speaker is saying. I, I, I am saying they are not exactly doing the right thing in terms of the realm of governance. There are people dying there. There's conflict raging. 
Business are interrupted, you know, so they're not smart. This is a fact. Is there anything you can do to reign over this, the people whom you seem to have suggested are not smart? Yes, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of work going on. Uh, within the framework of the East African community, the summit, the heads of state met and came up with a framework of how to deal with this problem. And what they have opted for is to make sure there must be dialogue. The conflicting parties must sit together and talk to each other and come up with viable solutions rooted in the constitution and the laws of Burundi. Do we, as the partner states in Uganda, in Rwanda, have even the moral authority to dictate how things should move or even suggest for Vujumbura? Yet we know we have changed our constitution repeatedly and Kigali is about to do the same, removing the, the, the term limit as well. You see, the constitution is, 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 is a tool which we use for governance. Are you having problem in Uganda? Are you having problem in Rwanda? In the, in the, in the, in, in the, in, in, like unrest, political unrest? I don't think so. You see, the most important thing for me is that the people must accept, must know, must choose how they want to be governed, and that's the spirit of the constitution. And that should be it for all partner states: Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi. If the Burundian people would like to be governed under a system that has term limits, so must it be. If Uganda has chosen to be governed under a set of rules that do not put term, uh, term limits, let it be. But the most fundamental thing is the people must choose how they want to be governed. And I think that's what happened in Uganda. You, not one person just decided to change the constitution. Uganda, and through their parliament, changed the constitution. Rwanda, through their parliament and through a kind of uh, uh, engagement with the population, decided to change their constitution. That is how people have chosen to be governed. For us at the East African level, people's authority is fundamental. The way people have chosen to be governed, they must be governed and peacefully and so. So what solutions do you suggest for South Sudan as the East African Legislative Assembly? Uh, but before I go to South Sudan, let me first ex expound a few things on Burundi. You see, Burundi is a full member of the community and uh, uh, and I told you there's dialogue being headed by President Museveni, facilitated by His Excellency, the former President of the United Republic of Tanzania, President Mukapa. This dialogue is ongoing. What is very important for us to know is that the, the stakeholders are so numerous, so bringing them together on a round table takes a bit of time. It's to, to, to let the people know that it is not true that East Africa is doing absolutely nothing from the parliament point of view. We actually had a public hearing on the case of Burundi. We got a petition from the Pan-African Law Society and the East African Law Society and other Kitu Chakatiba and several other uh, civil society organizations on Burundi that what is going on with several suggestions, some of them asking that Burundi should be suspended from, from EAC. Burundi should be, uh, many prayers, which we found was not really in order. We invited the government of Burundi to come to parliament we invited other political parties and the civil society of Burundi to listen to them. Why is the killing going on? What is it? They candidly spoke out their minds that some were against President Nkuruzi running for third term. Others were for. So we eventually resolved with them that there is need for all Burundians, majorly in the political realm, to sit together and agree on the kind of political system they want to run in that country. Whether they want to have a political system where there's term limits, then there, it must be clear that there are two term systems. And once a person has been given leadership, he should be given the time to lead. Okay. And this is the kind of discussions or conversation going on now. In on the issue of South Sudan, here is a country yeah. which is up, maybe about to become a partner of state, a fully mm. member of the mm. East African community. Mm. Mm. And yet, people who are trading with South Sudan, especially Ugandan businessmen, yes. have been demanding South Sudan to pay them over 40 million dollars, which they have agreed between the government of South Sudan and the business community and the government of Uganda. For years, the South Sudan, Juba has failed even to make good on the promise they made, just to pay for the goods and services delivered to them, to the government of South Sudan. How do you deal with a state that even in, be part of the East African community, yet it cannot handle a few things that bind us together as a community? First of all, the viewers may want, want to know that uh South Sudan was admitted politically in March by the summit. After the, the political statement of admission, 
there are other bureaucratic processes that the country must go through to, before it becomes fully operational in the ESC system. When the admission was done in March, in May they went and signed the accession treaty before the chair of the summit in, in Dar es Salaam. After they did that, they had to take the accession treaty back to their home to be ratified by the, by the, by the, 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 the Republic. After the ratification, then they will deposit the instrument back to the Secretariat and then after we roll them up into the various activities. They have not yet deposited the instrument of ratification in Arusha and therefore they are not yet fully participating in the various activities of the community. Now coming back to what you've stated, this is not unique only to, 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 to South Sudan. I want to build the history of how our business people the private sector has been suffering because of conflict in the region. You remember in 2007 when there was election confusion in, 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 in the Republic of Kenya, lots of traders lost property, goods and otherwise. Up to tomorrow, they are still claiming for compensation from the Republic of Kenya because of conflict in, at the Mombasa port and along the path, many traders lost their property. Leave alone that. Uh, the first scaffold that took place in, in, in South Sudan, before even the, the country was admitted in, in, in EAC, a lot of trade, traders lost their property there. So the most important thing that people in leadership or in governance should know, that there is need for good business environment for our economies to thrive. So if a state has committed itself to pay, and it's a fully member of the East African community like Kenya for the 2007 disruptions, mm. then why not? And if they don't, why can't you, you know, reign on over them because as an authority, as, 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 as an entity, and tell them to pay because this is little money to the state. Yeah, the two things that must be got clear here. The first one is that partner states are committed to making sure there is good business environment for the private sector. Two, the, 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 the political will do really exist. Viewers may want to know that the, the East African Court of Justice, the jurisdiction has been extended to, to take care of the issues of trade, conflict emanating out of trade related issues. So the East African traders or private sector must know that they have an arbiter in the East African but Court of Justice. Where is that where will, Honorable Kidega, hmm? where is that political will if the Republic of Kenya cannot pay the business people who lost their property during the 2007 uh, post-election violence in Nairobi? You, you may want to know that they went to court and the, the government of Kenya and these business uh, captains of trades have agreed to set, settle this thing, this dispute out of court. And I'm actually engaged with a few of the, 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 the people or the, the, the traders who are involved in this matter and we are pushing the agenda. I, I will not commit to say that the government of Kenya is not willing. It is willing, and that is why they have opted to sort the matter out of court. What we need to do as leaders at this level is to push the government to make sure the traders are compensated. Now, this pushing alone is not good enough. The ESCJ is in place, but we need legal framework that protects traders. I have just had a, a very good conversation with His Excellency President Museveni about two days ago about coming up with a, a a, a, a law that protects investors in the region where we put some obligation on states where they fail to provide good business environment and war break or some man-made confusion margins and a person who has sunk millions of his dollars is made to live with just a handbag away and his money burning because of conflict. That there, is exactly what happened in Juba. Exactly. 40,000 businessmen exactly. left with nothing but their clothes on. From the assembly point of view, I have already started working with some members to make sure we come up with a very stringent law that puts responsibility on partner states to provide good business environment. And if you fail to provide security for business and a businessman has got his money lost, you must be able to compensate that business person to a certain level to bring him back to business or to transfer his interest to another safer environment. This law we shall put in place. Part of that we are going to put in, into, that, in, into that piece of legislation issues of local content. Investors come into this region, they come with a lots of money, 
they, 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 they don't transfer technology to our local citizens. We want to introduce aspects of lo local content where if you come as an investor, you must employ local people, you must use local materials. For example, you know, a lot of the construction works going on in this region are being done by Chinese farms. Where are they getting the cement from? Where are they getting the iron bars from? How many Ugandans or East Africans have stake in those businesses? We want to make sure all investment that come, their shareholdings, that are local people, so that flight of capital out of the region is minimized. So in essence, what I'm saying is, as an assembly, we're trying to put in place a piece of law that protects investors or business people from losing their resources when conflict break out. We're like going, to take, South a, Sudan. We're going yeah. to take a break, Honorable, right, Honorable Danny Kidega. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to look into the issue that is, has been so sticky, the issue of Uganda exporting sugar into Kenya. It came with other political undertones. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara and my guest tonight is the Speaker of the East African Legislative Assembly, the Right Honorable Dan Kidega. There was an issue that became so sticky when Uganda exported sugar into the Kenyan market. And, and, and there was an agreement between President Museveni and President Uhuru Kenyatta. But it was even discussed right in the Kenyan parliament. How do you... How does, how, how does that even come up when two East African states find it hard to trade the mangoes themselves. Thank you. You see, Patrick, and, and the viewers may wish to know that, you know, integration or bringing sovereign states together to form an entity is a complex project. Regional integration is not something that is very light because it involves loss of sovereignty, loss of control, and many other things to come together to improve the efficiency of our trading. When Uganda, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and uh, 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 Uganda, Kenya, and, and, and United Republic of Tanzania was negotiating the, the, the custom union protocol, goods were listed and as the annex of the protocol. The goods were categorized. There are those which were meant to move freely in the custom territory. There are those who are graded as, uh, 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 as sensitive goods. And then there are those called essential goods. So much as we have an integrated economy on a single custom territory, there are certain goods that are treated differently, do, that do not exactly enjoy the free movement as they're supposed to be. Sugar is one sensitive good that its trade is highly monitored in the region. The fundamental problem that came in at about the time mm -hmm. was that some people were having allegations that the sugar that Uganda is trading in Kenya, some of this sugar is not manufactured in Uganda. We are doing re-exports. So all those things came into play. And I, 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 I'm very, very, very sure that it didn't mean that Uganda and Kenya were saying, let's not trade among ourselves. But they wanted to streamline the trade in this sensitive good called sugar. And that is how the matter was resolved. The unfortunate bit was the politicization of the whole trade by our counterpart politicians from majorly the opposition politicians in Kenya, who are saying now the Kenyan government, the government of the day, was preferring Ugandan sugar over the sugar from Kenya. And it was really clear that there was sugar deficit in Kenya, and they needed sugar. And why would you prefer sugar from Brazil, from Cuba, or from other parts of the world to sugar from the region. So these are the issues that came into play and discussions have been going on and the stress Despite of the fact that if you went to any supermarket in Uganda, yes. you'll find 70% of some common essential goods are coming from across the border in Kenya. That's right. And, and they would find a problem having sugar, just sugar, to go to Kenya. Yeah, that's why we, we really... Is on our trading but it's so, it's so in balance in favor of Kenya. That's why we really applaud the leadership of President Kenyatta Uru, who came out clearly, said the biggest trading partner of Kenya is Uganda. And there is no way you can block goods coming from 
Uganda into Kenya. So we should also maybe need to understand this, that Uganda as an economy is just picking up its pieces. It has been so minimally operating, exporting goods to other parts of the world or to the neighbors. It is just now that we are getting industrialized, the economy is getting stable, they are also producing goods that we are now sending it to other parts of the world or our neighboring. Kenya must come to understand and accept that Uganda is getting industrialized, it has goods now it has to sell to its neighbor. Our trade with Kenya is on the rise in terms of industrial goods and also agro-based goods. And this, of course, will put Kenya as an economy on some bit of pressure because a new kid is growing up in the neighborhood. So now the issue of work permits, because partner states, they still want the people to have work permits. But that is an encumbrance on a community that is supposed to be trading together and working together, moving towards the federation. Yes, the common market protocol in place that provides for free movement of goods, uh, services, for rights of uh, establishment and settlement of persons in partner states, allowing citizens of East Africa to compete for jobs all over. But this protocol does not outlaw work permit. It is only supposed to harmonize because if you move from, because we still have these borders in reality, in existence. So what, when you move what, from, what common market is that? When you still have to go and uh, apply for a work permit and pay for it and all that kind of stuff, uh, and yet you're supposed to be in a single common market? There's a lot which come into play. We have question of security, question of regulation of uh, workers' benefits, and several other things. So when a worker moves from one country to another, he must be treated like any other citizen, but there must be underlying regulations that govern me as Dan Kidega when I go to work in Kenya, yes, and when I go to work in Tanzania or Rwanda or Burundi. This set of regulations that govern me must be harmonized and made simple to allow free movement of the workers in the region and also put in place provisions that allowed migration of workers' benefits in the region freely to happen. These are some of the underpinning legislations that we are trying to come with to make sure the common market protocol is implemented. The work permit which is being charged in the region is not yet harmonized. I can give you, for example, in Tanzania, you pay almost uh, $2,000 for a person to settle and work in Tanzania. These are the kind of things we are fighting with the leadership of the day, saying that please, one, harmonize the work permit process of acquired acquisition. Two, make it easily accessible. Three, and affordable to citizens to reflect the, the spirit of integration and the spirit of the common market protocol. So these are the things we're working on. It will take time, but we will reach there. Political federation by now should have taken place in the earlier plans. So it should have been 2013 would be in a political federation. But we seem to have slowed down. And I think even in the next 10 years, I'm going to ask you whether you think in the next 10 years it's going to be possible for the three or five countries, or now six countries, to politically federate. Because there are those who are scared that, that maybe there could be some political dominance from maybe Uganda or some countries like Burundi can bring in insecurity and all that. Do you see that federation happen in the next 10 years? I am very optimistic that it will happen. When is the question? You see, one thing that we need to do as political leaders is to first develop trust for each other. There is still strong suspicion among the leaders in the region. And that's not to say that there's no progress. There has been discussion going on. We have more or less now agreed on the kind of political federation. Suspicion among leaders in the region. You, you mean to say when the summit of leaders, the heads of state meet, even themselves they suspect each other for something they are suspicious. Let, let, let me qualify. Of each other. Yes, let me qualify this statement when I say suspicion. You see, when we started integrating, you, when you're in meetings, this meeting cascades from technical people to, or to ministers, then to the, eventually at the summit level. You would see in the meetings people holding their files with a lot of care and fear still exists. Real fear do exist because of the background where we're coming from. The previous community collapsed because of political reasons. And there are, this is what still exists among leadership. And this is being torn down as we relate and gain trust of each other and deal with the sensitive issues quietly. And this is the kind of suspicion I was talking about. There's a background to that because we're coming from a failed community that happened in the 1970s. So 
and, 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 and that's why we are moving a little slowly. Now, what progress is in place for political federation? One, we have more or less agreed now on what kind of political federation we want. We are taking on with the confederation first, then eventually move into a total uh, political federation. I have just had meetings with the, my, our leaders in the region, and I have voiced the same concern you've just raised, that we feel as parliament that the political discussions is getting quietened. They need to be re, re, reawakened. The issue of political federation must be brought back on table for discussion. Most of the problem that we face today in the region is the absence of political unity and therefore lack of political framework to deal with challenges. If we were federated as a, as a region, Burundi may not be like where but, it is but, today. But, but why that silence? Why that political abeyance? Yet we know at one point, I think even now, this is a deputy secretary general in charge of uh, fast tracking of the political federation. Yeah, what yeah. do they do? It's actually not the DSG political affairs is not necessary for fast tracking, but to carefully construct the process of political federation. And that's where I'm saying now, the summit has directed the Council of Ministers already to come up with to start the discussion on the constitution of East Africa. And this is ongoing. I, I share your sentiment, and it is the sentiment of Parliament as well, that the political discussion must be reignited. I have just had consultation with President Museveni, and uh, I, my, my, my very honest opinion was that I think the Parliament must restart this conversation back and take it to the population, get it out of the boardroom, and let the population start talking about political federation. What kind of political arrangements do they feel is good for them? And, and for me, as the Speaker of the Assembly, in the next round of sensitization that my, the members of YALA are going to go to population, the issue of political federation is going to be central. We but must take this when, conversation when, to the people. Honorable Kidega, when you talk about political federation and this East African thing, and you sit at the Secretariat in Arusha, and, and, and all these can make meaning to you, yeah. but do you think you, the, you make meaning to the ordinary person in Bagamoyo, somebody in Ruhenjeri, somebody in... in, 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 in in Kenya. Absolutely. You know, Patrick, you know, the most important... In, in, in Yahururu, for example. Exactly. In, in my village in Gulu, in Atiako, somewhere like that. You know, the most important thing, if we effectively put in place and implement the cascading st uh, st stages of this integration, if the custom union is fully functional, if the common market is fully working, people are moving freely, goods are moving freely, services are moving freely, and there's right of establishment and settlement all over, people will demand for a unitary governance, for a unitary control, for one system that manages their movements and their business together. This lack of political federation is a sign that the other stages that are supposed to be implemented are not yet working well. I can assure you if we have a functional common market and a functional single custom territory and a common monetary system of converged economies, the people will demand for a common uh, uh, administration. There have that been fears from uh, other states, partner states maybe with the smaller economies, including Uganda and Burundi, that you open the market like you can and, and, and probably they can be swallowed up by the big brothers like Kenya, which could be maybe three or four times bigger uh, than some economies in, in the region. Uh, in fact, there was, I'm told, even a research that found that Tanzanians were skeptical about their land issues, that their, their land could be taken away, uh, could be encroached on by Kenyans and Ugandans. And even another research finding that Kenyan women were like, look, those Ugandan women could take <laughs> away our men. It may sound cheeky, but yeah. it came out in the research. That's true. The, 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 the committee the, the, the of eminent person that went to do some study on the fast tracking and finding out the views of the citizen about political federation, those issues came up, which is good. When things come up, then you deal with them. It is true that in the, in a, in a, in a, in a, when they are converging as economies, uniting to perform, there are gains and losses there. Small economies may also lose certain things. Even the big one may lose certain things, okay? And, and, and that's why there are remedies put in place to address such kind of losses that a country may face. Of course, there are issues of xenophobic thinking or mentality that can come at a level of a common market protocol, where now citizens move into another uh, uh, economy or another country and take up jobs there, take up business opportunities, the local one engine may rise up. So there must be provisions how such uh, uh, losses are addressed. 
in the treaty for the establishment of the, uh, the fundamental principle is that equitable distribution of benefits of integration must be put in place. So all those uh, uh, challenges will always be addressed because the foundation of how to be addressed are in the treaty for the establishment of the East African Community. But it is important to know that, that the net welfare gained by citizens is for all. Yes, in the, in the short run, they may uh, uh, look as if some countries will be losing. But the net efficiency of the economy, the welfare gain, will be beneficial to the entire community. So people should not shy away or, or, or on the basic fear that there may be loss of jobs, loss of land. For example, the question of land in Tanzania. In the common market protocol, land has been left out as some matter which is regulated by the municipal law, by the national law. It's not regulated at the EAC level, which I personally have a problem with because land is a factor of production. And if we are going into economic integration, the factor of production should move freely also as well. Because you're not going to integrate in the air, you're going to integrate on land. Okay? So for me, uh, uh, the, the, the thing I want to tell uh, the viewers out there is that economic integration in the short run can look painful, but in the long run, anybody, everybody is a winner. Because the, the economies will become more efficient, the welfare gain by the citizen is going to be spread all over, and the, 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 the small, small difficulties that we face today through movement cross borders will be wiped out and things will be moving faster. I want to draw your attention to something that happened in, in northern Tanzania a couple of, uh, I think, a year ago, when the Tanzanian government decided to expel um, herdsmen who had yeah. stayed uh, just at the northern border of Tanzania, Rwandan and Ugandan herdsmen. In a, really, what, what happened does not reflect the spirit of the East African unity. That is now the vote of confidence for the integration. That is the reason why we must integrate. If we were an entity, not sim sim simple, simple boundaries, such a thing would not happen. That is the more reason why we must move faster and abolish these small, small boundaries that we have and let our people move freely. There were issues of security among the cattle people, the, the, the people who were herding their cows. The government of Tanzania said there were security issues that they were sorting out. But of course, you know very well that this matter was discussed at the highest level of leadership and was resolved. But for me, it is a case that called for actually deeper integration of our people. To allow, because these are, these are the same people. If you look at the people in, in that part of Tanzania, Uganda and Kenya, they are the same people, they speak the same language, they talk the same thing, engage in the same economic activity. We, the politicians, are making our people live a very difficult life by herding them like we are herding cows, creating these boundaries, making them so difficult to move across the boundaries. We need to move faster and make sure the movement of persons across border is made easy. We look at, look at in, 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 in Kavari, Gatuna, Katuna, uh, Miramba Hills, same kind of people, cousins this side, another cousin the other side, and you restrict him he has just crossed over to get potatoes from the neighbors, from his relatives who are across the border, and you subject such a person to rigorous border control. That is not how the way our people so now, live. How do you relate with the European Union that has now we've seen the British the British people voting to get out of the European Union, the Brexit? And and how doesn't that take away from the East African community? You seem to be trying to fast track even the political federation and all that. Yet countries that are developed and have been together in a union uh, are slow. By the way, if as, if as Patrick, you may also want to know that at one point in time, uh, the, the, the European Union came to learn about integration from East Africa in our first, in, in our first uh, community. You may want to know that the East African community is one of the oldest communities that has lived. We had a custom union way before our countries even attained independence. That said and done, the, the, Brit, the Brits is, 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 is a big lesson to us. How the, the UK left the European Union is something we should learn a few things from. You saw the lamentations after the vote was taken. The people, the British citizens were majorly ignorant of the EU uh, integration. They didn't know what was obtaining. After they voted for an a, a, a exit vote, 
many who voted for it started regretting. The lesson to draw from that is that we must sensitize our people. Our people must know about... Or the, you must never try a referendum. Because some no, countries could go. A referendum is, is something you cannot avoid. When you're making fundamental decisions, the people must be involved. So, but the most important thing, awareness creation is very important. That's one, one big lesson that we must learn from the, 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 the exit of the United Kingdom from the EU. The other thing that we should know is that our treaty for the establishment of the community is well thought out in terms of membership. It is just not easy to walk away from this community. It is well needed. The legal framework is strong and viable. And our integration is people-centered and private sector, private sector led. Politics, yes, we the politicians try to do the administration, but it is people-centered. Okay, and uh, on, 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 then on the issue of um, uh, 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 how do we relate with EU? You know we have the economic partnership agreement that we are trying to sign with uh, the EU. Yes, uh, Tanzania has come out clear that we should not sign the EPRS with, uh, with the EU. Uganda is having a similar position more or less. My position and the position of my, the assembly more or less is not very far. One, we negotiated EPRS or we are supposed to, what we initial, British was, the Britain was still in the EU. Now it is out and it is one of our trading partners. Uh, Burundi is a member of the EU, uh, of the ESC, and the EU has lumped sanction on Burundi. They are all the reason for us to delay signing of papers right now. So that is a, a trading framework that we are trying to put in place that need to be carefully looked at. There are a number of technical issues within the agreements that need to be revisited, thought out clearly to make sure our economies do not suffer at the expense of the European Union economy interest. So the term of the assembly is coming to an end in June next year, yep. I suppose. Yep. And uh, I'm sure now the political heat is coming up for people who want to replace uh, you or even to retain their positions at the East African Secretariat or Parliament in Arusha. How is, it that, how is that going? First of all, you know, it, it, it is, we are, it, by 5th of June, we must be swearing in a new parliament, the fourth assembly. And uh, we would have concluded our tour of duties. Uh, honestly speaking, for me and many of my colleagues, we are very grateful to Uganda, Ugandans who have given us the chance to serve at the regional level. And uh, it is important for viewers to know that um, the East African Legislative Assembly has term limits. You can only serve two terms. You're elected and you can be re-elected for a further term, not more than two terms. So most of us Ugandans who are in that assembly do not have chance of going back to the fourth assembly. Six of us, actually, all of us NRM, cannot go back. So there is going to be a whole new lot of Ugandans to be elected by the parliament of Uganda to replace us in Arusha. And, uh, and, 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 and it is also important to know that uh, the elections of member of Yala will take place before June, because June is the swearing in. And therefore, election may take place in March or April. I've already been receiving a number of people who are declaring interest to go and serve at that region. The Parliament of Uganda will put in place the, 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 the election guidelines and uh, put in the, in the Gazette declaration of time when that election will take place. And we will elect our people to go and uh, represent Uganda in the... I'm told the number with interest, with ambition to represent us in Arusha, it's quite big. It's in hundreds. Yeah, you see. For the, only nine slots. Yes, it, it is a vote of confidence to us who are serving today. They understand. It could also be agreed, sir. <laughs> That's from your perspective, yes. Uh, the, the, the fact that we have really made people aware about the integration agenda and taken the parliament to the people, people are now more aware about the YALA and the EAC than at the time when we went in. And that's why there's now lots of interest. Over a hundred people have declared interest to go and run for nine slots of the of, 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 of representation. In uh, the and who are these? Could these be like has always been, uh, with all respect, uh, political failures in some cases <laughs> at their home? Yeah, some people fail in their constituencies. And yeah, absolutely. And you see, failing to to win an election doesn't mean you are a political failure. You are. You, it might be you are, you are, you are, your ambition has been delayed by voters not to go into that kind of office. Yes, there are those who lost seats in their local constituencies who have declared interest to go to Yala. I wouldn't use the terminology of calling them political failures. No. There are people 
who have lost elections, but they are not failure per se, or people who have failed politically. They have, you've known how voters conduct themselves in this country. Thank you very much. The Right Honorable Dan Kidega, a man with a rare sense of humility, who is the speaker of the East African Legislative Assembly. Having been on our show here, we are so grateful. Thank you. Good night and God bless Uganda. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you so much for <laughs> Thank hosting you. me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.